questions. And the next speaker is uh, David Albrecht with a presentation, uh, nanoscale imaging of live cells with confocal interferometric scattering microscopy. Please. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and present our work on confocal eye scats. So I want to thank the organizers. Um, I'm a postdoc in the uh, Max Planck Institute for the Science of Light in the group of Weitz and Nocta for nano optics. And uh, we're developing microscopy me methods for biomedical research. And uh, I'll start with the historic image of the 17th century uh, microscope from Van Leeuwenhoek. And uh, just, just as a reminder how transformative microscopy was to biology and our understanding of, uh, of life. And still to this date, I mean, we have heard a lot about fluorescence microscopy, but bright field and then also phase contrast microscopy uh, still play a major role in just about all of our um, daily laboratory lives. If we do cell culture, for example, here, some HeLa cells from the lab, and the contrast we see um, in, in this image comes from light absorbance, but also um, interference of different path lengths, depending. Um, now, small structures give us very low contrast. Um, here's an example of a vaccinia virus on a bare cover slip in a bright field. Uh, transmission microscope, and we can still see the viral particles at 250 by 350 nanometers because they scatter light. But if things become smaller, it gets really problematic. And you've just um, heard about iSCAT. I'll just uh, briefly uh, give you a recapitulation. So um, in interferometric scattering, uh, microscopy, we yeah, shine a laser at the sample. Some of the light gets reflected onto our uh, detector. Um, camera, and then if we have a nanoparticle, um, it can be really anything. It could be a bacterium, a virus, a, a protein that scatters some light that also then um, gets detected. We have our scattering signal, and we have the ref uh, reflected light, the reference, and then um, the intensity at the detector is then uh, a combination. Now, the reflected light is usually our background, but then the scattering that scales to the sixth power of our diameter of the nanoparticle, Rayleigh scattering, um, is what we usually detect, for example, in this uh, image of the uh, uh, larger virus particles. Now, the interferometric term only scales to the third power of the diameter, so we have this sweet spot um, where the scattering, if the scattering signal is too weak to detect, we can still um, see this term. And, um, this was uh, shown initially with gold nanoparticles on a glass surface, um, but let's uh, move uh, on to, to biology. Uh, briefly, um, this is the, the point spread function. You get the, the lateral point spread function or the axial point spread function in wide field, and the method is uh, great for nanoparticle detection. Uh, you can see uh, protein filaments um, if you don't have uh, uh, too much background, um, you can record at kilohertz frame rates if you just crank up your laser. Um, but the signal is always complicated by a complex spec like background. And you've seen this in the, in the image of the bacteria. So as soon as you have dense, um, yeah, dense biological material, um, all these scattering signals overlap. And this is uh, in cell imaging. Now um, here an example of a, of a live cell being imaged in wide field iSCAT, and you see some structural features, the outline um, of, the, uh, of the cell. However, um, it's not really the best technique for detecting cellular structure. Um, but, and uh, we've uh, touched this uh, yesterday, it's uh, also possible to suppress uh, these out of focus contributions, and what we've done now is to introduce a pinhole, so we're using now a confocal microscope to do eye scat. Now, um, we use this as a scanning technique, which slows it down massively. So we're, um, for, um, for a frame, we take about a, a second. But um, on the other hand, uh, we can afford to close the pinhole. And this increases our resolution. That's also something where, where we have an advantage over fluorescence microscopy, where usually you keep your pinhole at 1.2 area units just because you cannot afford to close it further, you lose too much signal. Whereas now here, um, we are looking at scattering, and we're not really limited um, by, by the signal, so we can just increase illumination intensity and then close the pinhole to gain this extra resolution. 
um, this is what the point spread function then looks like, um, laterally and axially, and uh, you can see that we, we lost uh, much of those side lobes. And uh, for, for cell imaging, uh, the, the example here of uh, the same cell now, where we already see much finer detail. I just put these side by side. So for the wide field eye scan, um, it's a small field of view. We could obviously then just um, take multiple images and stitch the cell. But for for the confocal eye scan, we already with our system get this 100 by 100 uh, micron in a, in about a second and are able to detect nanoscopic features. Now we like to put this side by side with fluorescence, which we can simultaneously record. And uh, what you see is that a lot of these fine structures here in the uh, um, that you see in the confocalized get image are uh, these protrusions of the oops um, protrusions uh, of the membrane here fluorescently labeled with uh, GPI GFP. Now it's a confocal technique. And the main advantage is we can perform optical sectioning. Now, this is a live COS7 cell um, where we recorded axial sections. And um, what, you, uh, what you can see here in the image is prominent these actin bundles ending in, uh, in focal adhesions, the membrane edge. And if I just go um, uh, to the next, um, yeah, this is a uh, the next section uh, recorded a little bit higher. Now the nucleus appears um, and, and other features like the endoplasmic reticulum. And the big advantage here is we can do um, label free imaging of subcellular structures. We now have, have a means to look inside the cell with this technique and uh, detect structures and its live imaging without the limit of photo bleaching. And here's a, um, a third section where now um, you can see here in the uh, a bit in the periphery, these uh, mitochondria appear. Now, a lot of these structures, it's, um, it's based on a priori knowledge um, to, uh, to identify them. However, we also combined everything with fluorescence and then uh, just made sure. So here's a, a few examples for confocal eye scan imaging and the corresponding fluorescence imaging where we then labeled these uh, structures in uh, live cells again. So first, the endoplasmic reticulum the, um, in the periphery of a, of a live cell, this uh, network. Um, then mitochondria, uh, an example. Um, the nucleus quite prominent in ISCAT, um, and then uh, also actin, for example, here. And you can nicely see, the uh, again, these contrast uh, changes um, that give you additional information. I will come back to that. Um, this is a movie where, um, again, in a, in a live Core 7 cell, and I just start, just start playing the movie and uh, just ask you to pay attention to everything going on uh, in the cell. This is sped up a little bit just, uh, just for fun, but you, what you're seeing here is the uh, tubular network of the endoplasmic reticulum interacting with a multitude of um, vesicles. And if you look at the center of the image, uh, you see these fine filaments and you see how they move, how they actually buckle. And, and these are individual microtubules that we are able to see in a live cell completely without a label. Now, just to be absolutely sure, these are really microtubules. We then went and labeled them. Um, but the fun part of this project was a lot of this was like first, uh, we saw a structure in the, in the cell and then went back to, to make sure it's really what we, what we think it is. Um, so the way how biology microscopy is really fun. Um, and, and here's now examples where we then uh, fluorescently stained the ER and microtubules in these cells. And, uh, what we got is that we can um, get the, the contrast uh, corresponding to this uh, to the image, and um, yeah, we are able to detect microtubules, distinguish them based on the contrast we get, but also the behavior, which is this uh, kind of uh, typical buckling. Now, the microtubules got about two percent contrast, whereas the endoplasmic reticulum here yielded about twelve percent. Um, now. Confocal iSCAD is also great for 3D imaging, and we've just heard about the potential to use this information encoded in the contrast. Um, so this is an example for single-plane 3D imaging. Again, the periphery of a, um, of a cell, 
and um, and what you see here is again the tubular network of the AR um, interacting with vesicles. But uh, towards the top of the image, uh, you see here these larger uh, structures that um, seem to be um, yeah vibrating in inside the cell, and these are ER sheets, uh, which we again fluorescently labeled to be to be sure. And um, if you if you've ever recorded those. In fluorescence microscopy, the method is just not um, on a at least uh, typical uh, fluorescence microscopy is not sufficient to uh, resolve um, these fast actual movements um, of the of the AR sheets. And uh, at the bottom now, you see this uh, 3D rendering of these AR sheets, how they're in the cell, and then we can also look at these oscillations and um, in our, um, to our knowledge, this is the first time of actually being able to see this in a, in a live cell, just because the resolution required for this imaging um, is yeah, difficult to achieve. Now, um, it looks similar if you look in uh, electron microscopy. Um, however, uh, one limitation here, so we record an image in a single plane, so we have excellent information in the contrast, but it's not um, absolute. So we have a, here it's a, it's a relative height map, height map. But since we have our interferometric point spread function, uh, we then can also go and record multi-plane images. And this is now, uh, again, the endoplasmic reticulum. It's a, it's a perfect structure for this kind of uh, uh, test and, uh, and benchmark, um, where we now uh, take stacks through the cell. And um, what I hope you appreciate is uh, this contrast inversion of the, uh, of the tubular network as we uh, focus through the cell. Now, we can take this information, and on the, um, on the right here, now you see a rendering, a 3D rendering of the, um, of the ER network imaged in this, uh, in this region. And now this, because we are recording stacks, is uh, absolute height information. Now, um, the images, uh, previous images, were mostly uh, unf unfiltered, so just, just raw data. This is now um, an image where we uh, subtracted the, the background, filtered it a little bit, um, and it's also a method that provides very good imaging for then segmentation. And the, uh, the example here is, again, the, uh, the endoplasmic reticulum and vesicles, and what we did was uh, um, segment the, the ER um, with um, a conditional generative adversarial network, and then uh, also perform radial variance transform to localize these vesicles, uh, nanoparticles. I mean, we assume there are vesicles. And the, uh, the cool thing here is then, obviously, I mean, this is all information in, in one video and one image sequence. Uh, we can perform 3D single particle tracking. Uh, and uh, um, playing this uh, video slow, and I, I would like to pay attention to this uh, particle here. Um, we have a negative contrast and it's wiggling around a little bit and then very uh, soon you'll see the contrast change. Now it's white and now it's gone. Um, and what we think this is, uh, is endocytosis happening at the plasma membrane. So um, a lot of these, um, if, you, uh, if you look again at the, at the larger image, uh, a lot of these dark spots, these uh, um, Nanoparticles that we that we detect there are, um, as we now uh, think we uh, we could show, are clathrin coated pits that are just um, or yeah floating on the uh, on the membrane. And in this case, uh, again from the actual information, uh, we could show how um, we get a little bit of diffusion or slow motion on the membrane, and then this endocytosis event, this contrast inversion that just shows how there's an axial uh, shift in position. And uh, in the um, very beginning uh, of, uh, of the small video, um, you could also briefly see the fluorescence labeling. So we uh, again labeled the clathrin uh, light chain here to, to make sure uh, these are actually clathrin positive. Now, another method um, uh, or another um, model organism that's very interesting, and uh, I've shown you vaccine virus in the be very beginning, uh, is um, yeah, looking at infection of cells, and uh, viruses are always 
um, yeah, of, of interest, but at the same time, usually difficult to label. And this is now an example of a HeLa cell infected with vaccinia virus. And what you'll see here is in, in dark contrast, um, uh, the viral particles then being protruded on actin tails. This is a mode of transfer from, from one uh, infected cell to surrounding cells. So confocal eye scan is really an, an ideally suited method for live infection imaging. Can be performed over days because you're not limited by photo bleaching. Uh, we have low phototoxicity mostly because there's just no absorption of um, the, um, but only scattering. And then um, we have uh, we are able to detect individual viral particles. If you want to combine it with fluorescence, you can always say, well, I have my all my eye scan data, um, and I want to label a particular uh, structure of interest, it's uh, possible to combine. To just uh, summarize uh, the, the presentation, so I hope I could convince you that confocal eyes get is really cool. Um, you should try it for live cell imaging. Uh, you can detect nanoscopic structures. I'll just play, play this video. Um, uh, we have low phototoxicity um, in comparison to uh, fluorescence microscopy, um, but it's readily uh, we can readily combine it with fluorescence. Now, if you want to try it, it's uh, relatively simple. Um, so if you have a confocal microscope to just uh, change the, um, the filter or uh, the, the beam splitter, the right one. And um, I didn't go uh, into, into detail, but uh, you can also combine it with wide field eyes get in the same setup if you want to, and then localize nanoparticles still um, at uh, kilohertz uh, frame rates and nanometer precision. Now um, we've done this uh, then also looking at SARS-CoV-2 interacting with live cells and this is um, the combination where we get the best of uh, both worlds. Um, with that I would like to acknowledge the, the team um, and uh, so this is the, the main driving force behind this project is uh, Michelle Kuppers, very talented PhD student in the, uh, in the group. Anna Kashkanova is a postdoc in the group and she's just recently published on uh, INTA, interferometric NTA, which uh, if you're uh, interested in EVs you should check out Jenny and uh, of course uh, Wahid. Uh, and with that thank you very much, I'd like to take questions. Thank you, David. Um, I suggest we leave the questions for the coffee break. We are a little bit behind the schedule. Or you can, of course, use the chat also, and uh, the speakers can answer your questions there. Maybe, maybe one thing. So the preprint just went online. Um, it's here in the. Um, oh, if I could, if I could get that slide again. Otherwise, um, just just Google it. So confocal eyes get, and it's uh, the preprint just went online on uh, Research Square. Thank you. Right. Let's thank you.